Why don't you open your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, all right? Look and see what Jesus had to say one day about a hot topic. And we're just going to tell it the way Jesus told it. Let me get myself all set up here on my little table. Jesus sat down to teach. I figure today I am as well. Now, one day, Jesus was trying to make this significant point about forgiveness. And it was in that context that he did what he often did. He told a story. And we call his teaching stories parables, and they're, uh, they're so insightful, so beautiful. The, the thing about Jesus, he, he could tell a story, and when he finished, he could just drop the mic. There wasn't any, okay, now here are the five principles that come out of this story. Everybody knew, well, I know exactly what I need to do next. I need to know what I need to stop, what I need to start, and how it needs to look. And uh, all done here. He was a master storyteller. So I'd like to take one of Jesus' stories and, and just take our time looking at what Jesus said and how he said it. And I think we'll find plenty of application for each one of us. Now, this is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 21. It starts with a question. A lot of his story started with a question from somebody, and he told a story to answer it. So here's how it starts in verse 21, Matthew 18. Then Peter approached him, approached Jesus, and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? You always wonder what Peter had going on, who'd gotten under his skin. Somebody had ripped him off in his fishing business. Uh, somebody had stolen from him. Somebody just mean-spirited in his life, that irritating him. Uh, Jesus said, I tell you, not as many as seven. Jesus replied, how about 70 times seven? Well, that's a lot of forgiveness. And then he told a story. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents, we'll talk about what that means, what that represents, was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, be patient with me, I'll pay you everything. And then the master of the servant had compassion and released him and forgave him the loan. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe. Not this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging me, Be patient with me, I'll pay you back. Much the same words. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what he owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed, and they went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then... After he'd summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have mercy, had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to jailers to be tortured until he should pay back everything that was owed. Verse 35, So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless... Every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. Now, let's look at this story. This is the story of a king, and it turns out that one of this king's upper-level employees in the kingdom, this is not just a, a guy. He's like a senior vice president in this company because to have accumulated the mass of debt he owed to the king, it would have taken years and a high position of access to scramble things, mess things up this badly in his life. So he's been systematically embezzling from the king and the kingdom for years to get to here. Now, he owes an astronomical sum of money. And what Jesus does is he takes the largest number for money in their uh, the talent, the largest sum of money that they have available in their vocabulary, 
and then he makes it plural. And so by doing that, uh, as, as you look at how language and culture work, it's like Jesus saying he owed a bazillion dollars. It's just a sarcastically ridiculous, out of, the, out of this world debt that this guy owes, and he is way in over his head. So it's like saying uh, he, he owes the national debt. He owes uh, the trade deficit kind of crazy money. And there's no way he could ever pay this back, get this mess he has created taken care of in, in l- multiple lifetimes. He can't pay it back. It's a mess, and he's stuck. So this story is a story about a guy that plain, unadulterated, forget about tomorrow, throw cow, caution to the wind, greed. Now, Jesus says, there comes a day of reckoning. You can't, they're going to audit the books, and somewhere along the way, somebody's going to notice, where did all this money go? This is not just a little bit of pocket change. This is an enormous uh, amount of funds, and now it has come to bear. And so there's a day of reckoning, and this guy's gotten called in. So this is like a board meeting. This isn't something everybody's going to show up for. This is, this is the upper tier of leadership in this guy's kingdom, in his world. And this guy is uh, going to be called on the carpet, and everybody has probably seen the agenda for the meeting. Now, sometimes, as some of you, I know, you're, you're overwhelmed by meetings and meetings and more meetings in your workplace. And if you can find a reason to not be in a meeting, you're pretty happy about it, maybe. This one, though, it's the one where people say, oh, I'm not missing this. I love to see someone else's disaster. We know this guy's a jerk. We know he's been difficult to work with. We know he's a crook. We just had no idea it was this big. This is going to be, this is going to be worth showing up for. It's going to be brutal. Now, imagine the embezzler. Imagine this guy. Uh, he's, uh, he's not an ordinary guy to have dug in this deep, to have made this big of a mess. He's also a high-level guy. He's, an important, he's the kind of guy everyone else stands up when he walks in the room, typically. Now utter humiliation in front of his peers, in front uh, of everyone else that is a part of the, especially the biggest in, uh, influencers within the kingdom. He's going to be humiliated in front of them, and his pulse is pounding, sweat on his brow, palms sweaty, and it's all over. There's no more bluffing. There are no more games to be played. No chapter 11, no assets, no rich uncle that's going to bail him out, no lotto tickets that are going to be able to cash in. He just finished. And the punishment is going to be thrown in jail, sold into slavery. But here's the deal. Slaves were something, but he's not going to be able to pay this debt off by being sold into slavery. It's going to take more than that. So the penalty is, and still not going to come close to paying off what's owed, sell you, sell your wife. So your kids, generation, 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 this is just how your whole family cycle is going to go from now on. It's all over. And the consequences of this are going to reach deeply into your heritage as a family. Now, still not paying anything off, but generational consequence to his sin, to how he has wronged the king in the kingdom. So he stands now, sentence is read, Sell everything, sell him, sell his wife, sell his kids, his children's children, until the unpayable debt is paid. And what is the next thing on our agenda of business for today? Now, at this point in Jesus' story, there have been no surprises. This is exactly what, this is what the operations manual of the organization says to do. This, this is, a court, standard operating procedures are being followed And at this point, something happens in the mind of this embezzler. And he thinks, I have been a pretty big deal around here. And people respect me, at least fear me. And maybe, maybe if I just turn this whole thing upside down and I just go all in on some kind of humility, maybe if, uh, 
maybe if I just fall on my face, complete humility, I start begging for mercy. It's a total long shot. This is just that last ditch, swing for the fences, hope it works out, one in a million chance kind of thing. But hey, what, what do I have to lose at this point, right? So no hope, might as well give it a whirl. So he plays it out. He falls on his knees. I'm guilty. I'm a terrible person. Oh, please, please have mercy on me. And, and just give me time. Give me opportunity. I want to make it right. I want to turn from my terrible ways. Now, imagine the other guys watching this play out. And they think, oh, oh, yeah. Like, this isn't embarrassing enough. This is, this is the worst. He's, he, even, this is low even for this, this way low guy. He owes his bazillion dollars. He knew the rules. He knew what would happen if he got caught. He's going to get what's coming to him. What makes him think that something crazy like this uh, could possibly ever work? Now, the people watching him... They're really shocked by this, but that's not the end of the shock because they're watching him going, really? Come on, this is ridiculous. And then they turn to say, what's the king going to say? And they spin around to the king, and this is even crazier. He's all misty-eyed over the whole thing, bottom lip quivering. He had compassion on this guy, of all people, this guy. He's all choked up. And listen, this guy, where he is, the king, the, the master in this story, he didn't get to where he was by being an easy touch, by being taken in by con men. He's a sharp guy. He, he's a powerful person, but he's all choked up. He looks at the crooked embezzler. He thinks about him. He thinks about his family. And something happens in his heart. Filled with compassion for this guy who has wronged him and uh, plenty of other people for a long time and so big, so bad. He bends down, brings this guy to his feet and says, you're not going to be a slave. You're not going to lose your family. In fact, then he adds something even crazier. You don't have to pay the money back. You have as much time as you want to do, but you have your old job back. You can just go right back to life as life has been. Okay, at this point, the people, think about the people listening to Jesus when he told the story the first time. Well, this story has a lot of plot twists. The, it keeps getting crazier and crazier the longer we listen to Jesus' story. He cancels the the sentence, forgives the debt, the unpayable debt does not have to be paid back. That's way more grace than this embezzler himself ever. He, he, at some point, while he's doing all of his stuff, he looks up and goes, are you for real, man? Are you serious? Is that, you're really going to do this in this way, at this level, this scope? Now, it's crucial to understand uh, this part of it in order to get this story because of what it's saying about God. Because recognize the king, as I'm calling him in the story, is God. That's, that's how this story is playing out, this teaching story that Jesus gives us. When the king forgave the debt this guy owed, the debt didn't disappear. Like, and suddenly, all the money reappeared in the, in the treasury. It's gone. It's gone. So... Somebody, if this guy isn't going to be punished for this, the loss is going to have to be absorbed by somebody else. Somebody else is going to take the hit. Somebody else is going to feel the full penalty of this. And in this case, it's the king. He's not getting his money back. It's not going to be all better tomorrow. But the king has determined in his own heart that he is... He's going to take the loss so that this guy can be forgiven of the debt. It's all coming out of the king's pocket. The embezzler can't believe it. He didn't have a prayer. He throws himself on the mercy of the court. 
the king takes the loss. He gets the grace, all forgiven, free. He goes home to his wife, and they just celebrate. We're not going to prison forever. Uh, we're, we're not going to be slaves forever. We went from death to life in one, one moment with this very unusual king. Okay. Now, let's step back again from the story for a moment and reflect. We said the king is God in this story. So who's this embezzler in the story? Well, that's us. That's me and that's you. So now you are in Jesus' story. And let's see how that plays out. Jesus says to us, to the people listening on this day, to Peter who began with the question, you have been accumulating this crazy mountain of moral debt before a just and holy God for your whole life. And it's a lot bigger than you think it is. In fact, there's no way, there's no way you're paying this back. You're in way over your head. You're overwhelmed by what's taking place. You have to see who you are. And not only do you have the mountain of moral debt, but you keep adding to it. You're not done adding to it today. You're going to keep on offending, stealing, from God. This is your condition, my condition. Think about this. Every time you were less than honest, I'm not saying every time you stole a bazillion dollars. I'm talking about every time you were less than all out honest. Every time you fudged on your expense account at work. Every time you, you decided the government's getting a lot of my money already. I'm thinking I'm going to keep some of it for me by just kind of shading it in my direction. Every time you were just unkind to a five-year-old, how about that? Every time you, you should not have made that cutting remark that really, that really just is, is sometimes it's like a paper cut, sometimes it's like a stab of a knife. Every, in some, every time you you should have spoken in love, but you didn't speak in love. Every time you refused to be grateful, every time you gossiped, every time you were, every selfish act, uh, every racist joke, every sexually impure thought or deed, every judgmental attitude, every time you held a grudge against someone and nursed it and nursed it and enjoyed it and enjoyed it, you were adding to this, and that's just a quick sketch, you're adding to this mountain of moral debt that you owe to a just and holy God. And all of us human beings, we're in the same boat. And we've accumulated this mountain of moral debt to God, and all of us have. See, I, I look at this and I say, okay, I'm a pastor of a church called by God to help people know God better and love God more and helping people to understand how to experience a relationship to God and spiritual growth with, with God. And so I look back, and uh, you know, a couple of months ago, I'm working on this sermon in my office, and I'm sitting at my computer, and it took me all of you know, 30 seconds to come up with that quick list uh, that I just ran through. And do you know why? Because my wife has done everything on that list. That's... <laughs> That's how I know. No. You know, I hardly ever warn her when I'm doing that stuff. She was in the first hour, and uh, I told her this was coming. And I was going to say, no, no, really, it was me. It was me. And it is me. I think it's all of us. Now, if, if you will be honest, and my goodness, it's Sunday at church. Why not be honest, right? In your heart this morning, as you examine your life, you know you. You know the truth about you. I know the truth about me. You're a fallen person. You've sinned. You've piled up this mountain of moral debt before a just and holy God. And the Bible says there's coming a day of reckoning. Every one of us is going to face a moral audit as we go forward in this, in this uh, life. You're going to face the fact, too, that you owe an unpayable debt. It's not like you're going to make this one up. Like, well, I'm trying to be more religious, Chad, starting today. I'm going to try to do good things for other people. I'm going to give some money. Uh, I'm going to try to be back in God's good graces. 
but it's an unpayable debt. Just as just a quick way to understand this, um, because the Bible talks about our sin, and we typically say, "Well, I don't know that it mine's really a mountain of moral debt." Our favorite way to do this is to say, "You know, it's not like I'm Hitler." Poor Hitler, you know? That's the only time you hear me say poor Hitler. But poor Hitler, everybody wants to compare with Hitler. Well, there's a whole lot of mountains of sin debt before you get to Hitler uh, in this world. And we've piled up more than we think. Think about this. Like if, I, if I'm in a store and I'm really frustrated with my customer service and they have their trash can sitting there and I just haul off and I just kick the fire out of that trash can and I just bust it all to pieces... I'm going to have to pay for a new trash can at the least, right? Simple enough. Consequences for your actions. If I'm standing at a rope with a crowd and the President of the United States walks by and I think, boy, I've been trying to figure out my taxes for this year and I don't like it. And I haul off and I kick the President of the United States It's a different penalty. Do you know why? Because a trash can is one thing, the president is another, and the consequences of those actions are different levels of consequence. How about this? Sin against a just and holy God, that is so vastly bigger than anything else. And the things that we do, and that we continue to do, to pile up that debt that we owe to God because of our sin, it's a lot bigger than most of us are willing to reckon. We're in trouble. Well, you really can't balance the scales on this. You can't dig your way out of this debt any more than this guy in Jesus' story could dig his way out of the debt. The Bible says there's another way, and that is you just throw yourself on the mercy of the court and say, God, I'm a sinner and I'm a... I have accumulated all of this and I know I can't pay for it. But I believe that what Jesus did for me, because see, God was moved with compassion. God is moved with compassion when you tell him that today. And so God, moved with compassion, sent his sinless son, Jesus the Christ, to show us how to live on this earth. And because he had never sinned, he could go to the cross to pay for the sin that we have committed. And how did a few hours on the cross on a Friday a long time ago, how did that pay for all of our sins for all time? And it works the same way. It's because of where Jesus came, not just the amount of suffering in that six hours, but where he came from to experience that suffering, that distance, because of who he is, that was sufficient to pay everything that needed to pay for anyone who would come and say, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. The Bible says on the cross, Jesus paid our sin debt. Uh, It had to be absorbed. It couldn't just be looked past. And he died on the cross so that we could be set free and be forgiven. And he, he did this, extra, this is extravagant forgiveness. Extra, uh, forgiveness with abandon, without regard to cost. God's forgiveness is, is shown so clearly, so powerfully, so with, with such grace at the cross. Now, it, you may be under the impression, because most people are on the self-improvement plan here, if I try to be good, I can repay the debt. The Bible says you just need to give that up. You need to throw yourself at God's feet and say, I know it's by grace, not because I earned it, not because I deserved it. And I know my only responsibility in this is to get this right. The only way this gets bridged is God offers it as a free gift, and I need to receive it by faith to believe what the Bible says about Jesus is true. What Jesus did at the cross did everything that needed to be done for, to pay for my mountain of sin debt. And that when he was raised from the dead, he proved he was, he was God. And he proved that what he did at the cross paid it all. 
and I need to surrender my life to him. He's going to be the king, the master, the leader, the, the ruler, the guide from this day forward. Some of you have uh, been in kind of a sin management phase for a long time, maybe, trying to be good enough, trying to measure up. And today is your chance to get this right. Like this guy in the story, there's an opportunity. And I want to lead you in a commitment prayer. We do this, and I do it always with a bit of trepidation that you would think that the religious activity of repeating a prayer would save you. But it has to be your heart with God's heart. But using some of the language we've used to describe this today, I want to lead you in that kind of commitment prayer, okay? Maybe as I'm praying this out loud, maybe just give you the words you need to voice this to God. So let's bow our heads in prayer. This is your day to be set free from what is unimaginably beyond your reach. To say, dear God, I confess the fact that I am a sinner. I have a mountain of moral debt I cannot pay. I now confess my sin and put my faith in Jesus. I want to receive your free gift of forgiveness because of Jesus' death at the cross that he died in my place to take my punishment, to pay my debt. I put all my faith in what Jesus did to pay. I want Jesus from this moment to be my teacher, my Savior, my Lord, and my guide. Thank you for amazing grace. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, today was your day to say, no more games, no more justifying, no more rationalizing, no more just trying harder. But today, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. Or I, today, I, I'm leaning into this, and I want to understand what it means to follow Jesus. These uh, yellow Connect cards, you can grab one of these between now and the end of the service. Put, just put your name on it. And uh, there's some boxes there about Today, I received Christ as my Savior. I want to talk to somebody about what it means to follow Jesus. You just mark that and bring it to me, a member of our ministry team back here at the Connection Center after we're dismissed because we'd love to have that conversation with you. Now, back to our story. Because this crooked embe embezzler, he receives this grace. This is awesome. Wow, what a guy. But it's not the end of the story because Jesus, the master storyteller, he has a two-parter going here that really is a, a crazy story. The embezzler's off the hook. He owes his life, his freedom, his family to the king. And the king's grace doesn't have to repay a cent. Okay, so everybody else, they've known him for a while. And he's been there for a good while to get in this big of a mess. He, he didn't just show up yesterday. And so they're all looking to say, what difference is this going to make for him? How's he going to be a changed guy based on this experience. What's it going to be like to work with him tomorrow after this crazy day in his life? Well, find out quickly. He uh, walks, walks along. He comes upon another guy, another employee of the kingdom, and this guy owes him something. But it's a small debt. It's not like the overwhelming crazy mountain of debt that is impossible to repay in multiple lifetimes. This guy, he just, he just needs a little... It's more like uh, instead of a bazillion dollars, he owes a hundred dollars. But because of where he is in life, where he is the company, he's really not able to. He's not able to pay it back right now. He just needs a little bit of time. So this guy, much much poorer guy, he says, "I, I, mean, I don't have the money. But if you can just wait till the end of the month, you know, wait till the next payday." I can repay you what I owe you. Just give me some time. Just, just some grace. And he asked for grace. And what's amazing about Jesus' storytelling here, like all these places, but especially here, it's almost the exact same language that the former embezzler used to ask for forgiveness. This guy's using pretty much the same, uh, the same line. 
he be, the embezzler begs the king for grace. This guy's begging this, the, the VP for grace. Be patient with me. I'll pay you what I owe. The great difference this time, it's actually doable. He just needs some time. So everybody sits back and waits. Well, what's he going to do with this? How's he going to respond to this? What's going to happen next? This embezzler, this cheat, forgiven everything, thinks to himself, I am not going to absorb this. I'm not making the same mistake that soft-hearted sap of a king made with me. I'm not that guy. I'm a hard-driving business guy. I'm not, I'm not going to start going easy on people. I'm not going to get stuck with having to take this hit. I'm going to make him pay. The guy's on his knees before him. But this guy, he doesn't have any tears in his eyes for, for this other fellow. There's no quivering lip in this play, in, 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 this, in this case. No compassion in his heart. You're paying. You're paying everything because I'm not paying for you. He takes the poor man, says he grabs him by the throat, chokes him, has him thrown into prison where, of course, he won't have any hope of repaying because he won't have any income. The debt uh, is more than the forgiven embezzler is willing to absorb. And he says in his heart, I'm going to make you pay. Here is the truth about forgiveness. The grace-filled life is what we're focusing on. Authentic forgiveness is never cheap. Somebody's going to pay. When you get hurt, and I recognize some of you have been hurt deeply in all kinds of different ways, levels. The hurt is deep. The hurt is unfair. And I think our natural inclination is always, I want the other person to hurt like they have hurt me. The pain that I feel, I want them to feel the pain that I feel. And especially those of you, you've been hurt unjust, unfair, ruthless kind of ways. You want the other person to pay. And that is our human nature. Some of you here today, you, you say, I have been royally used and abused. Some of you were cheated, you were betrayed, deeply wounded. Some of you have been in a financial situation where somebody took advantage of you. They, they robbed you, they cheated you, and they did it deliberately. It wasn't like, by, oh, I didn't realize. No, it was deliberate. It was, by, it was with malice. And some of you have been in a situation at work where you've been the recipient of just some brutality where somebody was playing you and they cut your legs out from under you so they could get a promotion, so they could get the raise and just trampled over you and you trusted them and it's unfair. Some of you have been in a relationship where you trusted somebody. Family, friends, somebody at work. You trusted them, you trusted them, you trusted them and they, they betrayed you and you're hurt. And the hurt is deep and it's personal, and it is absolutely not fair. Someone ran up a moral debt with you, and you can, without a calculator, you can, you can say, I know exactly what they owe. I know exactly what they've done. I can quantify it quite easily. And you're saying, yeah, but if I extend grace, if I forgive, then I have to take I have, this pain stills my pain. I don't get to unload it on them. And the cost is too high. I want to hurt them back and I want to get even. And, and you're right. If you forgive someone, there's a cost. It's going to cost you something. Cost you something of you. Cost you something you really, really want. And the truth is, the only thing that costs more than extending that kind of extravagant grace forgiveness the only thing that costs more is to not do it because what happens is it's a bitterness that begins to eat away at your own heart it's going to take away pieces of you that are precious the the parts of you that make you make you special in the sight of God and that bring joy to others, that part just starts to eat away like a cancer in your heart. And you've got to forgive. 
Now, I want to ex explain some things about forgiving because this is where it becomes murky for a lot of people. They say, well, I don't want to forgive. Forgiving is not condoning what they did. It was wrong. It was evil. They, so you're not saying that. Uh, it doesn't mean you're excusing them. It doesn't mean you're tolerating injustice. That, well, they're just getting away with things now. God's a God of great justice. And it, it also doesn't always mean reconciling. We, we seek to be reconcilers and to be reconciled as much as possible. But I, I wouldn't say you need to put yourself back in a position where if they choose not to change their heart, you don't have to be on the receiving end of another round of uh, hurt and pain. Uh, but you can, you can let it go. You can forgive. You can turn it loose. And I'm telling you, that is not easy. In my experience with some difficulties in my own past, uh, I, 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 I forgive them, I forgive them, I forgive them, I forgive them. And one day I woke up and somebody mentioned them and my face didn't turn red and my pulse didn't quicken and I knew somewhere between here and there forgiveness finally took place because up until then it was still like that. It was still just under the surface all the time simmering, waiting to explode. You have to forgive. So how do you do that? And again, I, I know the way it feels and the way it looks. You say, that's just crazy talk. That is just crazy talk. That, that is so off the charts, way up here, beyond me, beyond my skill set, beyond my heart. How, how can you find the power to extend that kind of grace and forgiveness to someone else who does not deserve it. And here's the only way it works. The only way I can do that with anybody else in my circles of impact and hurt is to have experienced it at such a ridiculously extravagant level that it's changed how I think about people and I think about circumstances and and I think about myself. And if you've experienced the ridiculously extravagant forgiveness of God for your mountain of mortal debt, you can hardly refuse to offer it to someone else that truthfully, no matter how bad, it's a fraction of what you've been forgiven. And that's the essence of the story Jesus tells so today, I'd like to offer you this. Here are four easy ways to forgive. Not hardly. That's not how Jesus did it here. There are principles of forgiveness that are helpful, and we've talked about those things in the past, but today I want to do it this way. How do you forgive? How do you become a grace-filled grace follower of Christ? I give you this, the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus who died on the cross, that's what I give you. You put that perspective covering your life because he covered your sin. And that's what I offer to you today. Nothing more, but certainly nothing less than the cross of Christ. Because it gives us the perspective this story is all about that perspective. It gives us a measure that ought to right what is wrong and how we see life. And it makes us the kind of people that start reflecting, even on a much lower level, the grace and forgiveness of our God by great being a grace-filled, forgiveness, quick person with the people around us. One more part to this story. And truthfully, I kind of wish this part wasn't in here because it's so creepy. It, 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 is, it, is, it is so frightening in its implications. It, it's like a monstrously 
difficult exclamation point that Jesus puts to everything else that's already been really, really big. But I'm going to tell it anyway because it's not my story. It's Jesus' story. The embezzler who has done the unthinkable. He claimed this great forgiveness of the king and denies it at a much lower level to someone else. This ridiculously sinful person with this mountain of moral debt who has been forgiven so much by God refuses to extend it at a much lower level to someone else who has who owes him something but not even close to the level no grace to the life for this guy and word gets back to the king because the people who are watching this guy they go, oh my goodness, there's no way we can't, we can't turn him in for this. This is nuts. And so, the ex-embezzler is brought into the throne room a second time. And there's another exchange. But this time, there are no tears, there's no, plead, no pleadings, no falling to the ground, no begging for mercy. Those days are over. There are no more bargains to be made. This time the king just says, hey, man, you did not get this. This lesson that should have been so clear to you, that should have so overwhelmed how you even see the, the lens through which you see everything else in, the, in your life, in this world, it did not penetrate anything about your head or your heart. You have gravely misunderstood me, says the king. If you think I'm some kind of fuzzy-minded incompetent who is not discerning and is easily manipulated, that, that is just not going to be so. And so if you thought that you could, you could have my forgiveness at this extravagant level, this grace at this ridiculous above and beyond all you could ask or think kind of way, but you could go on and just abuse whomever you wanted to from there. Man, you haven't got me, dude. Uh, if you thought you could go back, I'm going to be the same hurtful, selfish, arrogant, unforgiving, ungracious person I was before after having experienced this, you were badly mistaken. You were shown forgiveness, but you wouldn't give it. You, you were offered grace, but you wouldn't extend it to someone else. You were offered incredible love, but you refused to live it. I offered you the miracle of forgiveness, to live in a world of grace, but you can't, and here's, the, here, here's where it lands, you can't res, have truly received that for yourself and deny it to someone else. And there is one of those scary verses in the Bible. Take him away, throw him in prison, leave him there. End of interview, beginning of sentence. Jesus says those sobering words, so also. My heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother and sister from your heart. Oh, that's big. So now... Jesus went on to something else after that. And he left him to decide. And all of us have to decide, what are you going to do about that? And I'm, this, this story doesn't end the way some do, but you know, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And I want to encourage you, please choose to forgive. Let some things go. Everything can't be a big deal. Everything can't be something that you hang on to. and Anger and bitterness and resentment toward other people. Just put the burden down because it's going to kill you. And let it go. And choose. Choose life. In the story my challenge to you. 
Let you upgrade to a grace-filled life.